Paddy, thank you so much for that tale. And the next on our list is one of our great visitors from Newfoundland. We have um, Kelly Russell, and Kelly's going to bring us a bit of music. He's been a professional musician since 1975, and he's been a no member of a number of landmark groups, Figgy Duff, the wonderful Grand Band, the Planker Down Band, Bristol's Hope, the Irish Descendants, and Kelly Russell and the Planks. Working closely for many years with legendary fiddlers, Rufus Geinhard and Emile Benoit, learning, recording and documenting their music. Kelly has inherited genuine status as one of Newfoundland's leading traditional music promoters and performers, so we're gifted to have him tonight. His label, Pigeon Inlet Production, released over 30 LPs and CDs from 1979 to 1997. He performs his solo show tunes and tales of Pigeon Inlet weekly in summer at the Crow's Nest in St. John's, featuring tales from Pigeon Inlet by his father, Ted Russell, and the unique fiddle music of, New of Newfoundland. He has been recognised with the Marius Barbo Award for a significant contribution to Canadian folklore. He's a designated province's first tradition bearer. He was awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal and named to the Order of Canada. This year, he received the Musician's Achievement Award from the East Coast Music Association. So we are very honoured to have this great star, Kelly, in our midst. I'm just going to unmute Kelly now and hopefully we might get a second tune later in the in the evening. So Kelly, are you there? Are you Kelly? Is this on mute? No, oh, I'm here. There you are. Sorry, Kelly, that would be my computer. Lovely to have you. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this. Um, I'm going to do. Uh, Two pieces as my as my segment. If you wanted something else later on, I'd be happy to oblige. Um, many of the stories I tell, as you mentioned in the introduction, are uh, stories originally told by my father, Ted Russell. Uh, he was invited uh, to come on the radio once a week on a, a radio program back in the 1950s, and uh, he would tell a story about uh, the people who lived in a fictitious but very typical Newfoundland outport community called Pigeon Inlet. Uh, so this story features two fishermen. Um, the uh, narrator of the story is Uncle Mose, and uh, Uncle Mose and Grandpa Walcott are, uh, they find themselves uh, in a bit of a quandary this one evening. They're, they're experts in, the, in the, anything to do with the fishery, uh, predicting the weather, boat building, all that sort of thing. But uh, they found themselves in a very uh, difficult uh, spot this one evening as this story will tell. And uh, for, for Patty, uh, I'm going to play, as he mentioned in his story, uh, the concertina to introduce the story. So this little tune, the Pigeon Inlet tune, will transport us back from today, back to the early 1950s in the Outport Newfoundland fishing village called Pigeon Inlet. I've ever done in this world, the one I never want to do again is babysitting. Now I had a good dory mate, uh, Grandpa Walcott, and we pulled through safe and sound. But when I think back on it, never again. Grandpa was stuck that night good and proper. You see, Grandma and her daughter, Aunt Sophie, and her daughter, Suze, who was visiting here from Corner Brook with her six-month-old baby, were all invited out to a party that the Women's Association were having on account of there being three generations of members there all at one time. Now they could have got Liz Nye, that's uh, Jethro's daughter, to babysit, but Grandpa said Liz would have come over and brought along those uh, gramophone records, uh, the ones Grandpa can't stand. 
He said a night like that would have drove him crack. So that evening, he asked me, would I take a birth with him, babysitting? And I signed up. Well, from now on, whatever babysitting there is to be done in Pigeon English can be done by Liz Noddy. With her bubble gum and her all shook up and her jailhouse rock and all the rest of it. Now, the women were gone when I got there. The baby was asleep upstairs and grandpa had the cribbage board all set up on the kitchen table. Now I asked him, did he have any instructions what to do if the baby woke up? Grandpa said no. Well, he said, uh, now Sue's had made some funny remark about a formula being somewhere or other. But now uh, being as how the only formula we knew about was the one you use for finding how many cords in a pile of pulp wood. Well, we figured that had no connection with the baby. So we started our game of cribbage. Now, <clears throat> the women had said, they'd be home before 10. But uh, <clears throat> being women, there was no sign of them at half past when the baby started to bawl. Well, we waited you know, to see if the squall would die down. But it got so bad, it was likely to frighten all the neighbors. So Grandpa went upstairs and brought him down. Well, when that baby grows up, it won't cost him much in soap to wash his face. Oh, no. All he'll have to do is open his mouth. There'll be no face left to wash. Now, Grandpa had him uh, wrong end up when he brought him down, but um, even after he upended him right, he bawled harder than ever. I made signs to Grandpa, there was no sense trying to talk, that there must be a, a pin sticking in him somewhere. So uh, Grandpa held him up, sort of as you might say, by the cross trees, while I examined amongst his rigging. Well, the next thing we knew, the whole outfit tumbled to the kitchen floor, and there he was, the poor little feller, in his bare poles, bawling, if it was possible, harder than ever. Well, Grandpa said something to me about uh, getting the canvas back on him, quick. But sure, like I told him, anybody with one eye, or for that matter, with no eye at all, could tell. We weren't supposed to put that back on. Well, Grandpa agreed. Uh, the best thing to do uh, was poke that into the kitchen wood stove and look in the sail locker for a new outfit. Well, we located the sail locker uh, over on top of the sewing machine. And after we had an argument of whether we should put a jib on them or a forcel, well, we put both on them. <laughs> like Grandpa said, best to play it safe. Only trouble was this made them ball even her. Well, says Grandpa, Mose, me son, there's only one solution for this. What, said I? Grow, said he. It would have been better, said he, if Sue's had a told us what to feed the youngster, instead of talking about cords of pulp wood. But now what could we feed a young fellow that age? Now it was cold moose meat in the pantry. But no, oh no, a, a piece of moose meat. Well, that might choke him. No, something smooth we wanted. But what? Well, Grandpa had the answer. Fat pork! So I took the baby while Grandpa headed for the pork barrel. And he come back in with a lovely little chunk, about half an inch each way. But now I had misgivings. Now, there's no question of fat pork as to smoothness, or even nourishment. But with no teeth to chew it, well, supposing it gives the baby indigestion. Well, Grandpa had an answer for that, too. Moses well, said, we'll tie a string onto it. Well, then, if it hurt him, well, we had a way to get it back. So that's what we are. Well, do you know, that baby swallowed that hunk of salt pork like a real North Shoreman.
And before Grandpa had him halfway up the stairs, he was almost asleep and quiet as a mouse. Well, it was then that the horrible thought struck me. What if the baby swallows the string and all? But after Grandpa came back downstairs, he said as how he thought of that very danger. And he had tied the other end of the string to the baby's big toe. What said I? When you laid him down, didn't he stick up his legs and, and slacken the string? Oh, yes, said Grandpa, he did. And then I tied a ship shank in it to tighten it up so that when he dozes off again and straightens up his legs, up to come, easy as anything. Well, five minutes later, we creaked upstairs. And there was the youngster, sound asleep, with his legs straightened up. So uh, Grandpa untied the string from his big toe and picked up the other end off the pillow and we had both that string and fat pork in the kitchen stove, on top of that other thing, just as we heard the women coming back from the party. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see hands. So, uh, so I have one more uh, short piece, uh, which is uh, kind of a, a personal story in a way. Um, and I, I'm going to play a fiddle tune uh, with this one. Uh, I learned, uh, as a young fiddler, I learned many, many tunes from the older fiddle players uh, around Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, the, the two uh, most notable fiddlers, uh, ones that were best known perhaps, uh, Rufus Ginchard and uh, Emile Benoit. And I'm going to tell you a little story about Emile Benoit. Uh, he would compose a lot of his own tunes. He was a French Newfoundlander. And uh, he, he never traveled to... Um, uh, foreign parts or to other other cities outside of his own local area until he was almost 60 years of age and uh, he became popular at the folk festivals. So he would travel off to this festival in, in uh, Winnipeg and another festival uh, out to Vancouver and this one time we uh, were performing at the Mariposa Folk Festival in Toronto and uh, coming back from that festival uh, Emil had composed a, a, a new tune and he hadn't christened it. He didn't have a name for it. So we were in the airport and uh, getting ready to get on the plane. And we went to the to check-in counter. And the the, uh, uh, the lady asked Emil. She saw he had his uh, little suitcase and a fiddle case. And she said, "Sir, uh, he checked in his suitcase. And sir, would you like to check your violin uh, into the baggage?" And Emil, of course, in his uh, French Newfoundland accent, uh, said, "No, no, uh, I cannot put uh, put that in the baggage." How can I play it if it's in the baggage? Uh, so sure enough, uh, once the uh, once we're on the plane and we're uh, we've reached cruising altitude and the little seatbelt light uh, switched off and uh, the the trolley comes down the the aisle with those little bottles on board and sure enough, Emil takes out his fiddle and begins to play. And uh, he at, at one point uh, near the end, when we're uh, getting near the end of the trip home. He played the tune. He said, "Is one I compose." He said, uh, "I have no name for it, but the one I compose." Uh, and he played. He played this tune. And uh, uh, once it was finished, the uh, uh, air hostess came on the the speaker and said, uh, uh, "Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's time to put your chair backs and trays in the upright position. Uh, fasten your seat belts. Put away your fiddles, because we'll soon be." Arriving in St. John's, and Emil had it, and that's what he called his tune, Arriving to St. John's, and it goes like this. Thank you. 
Thank you. Oh, Kelly, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. I'm just going.